Hello and welcome to another video aiming for the very top grades. Today we're looking at something you're probably familiar with, the opening stage directions. Uh, but I'm only probably going to deal with two of the ones that you're familiar with and introduce you to about eight that are going to propel you into the top grade boundaries. So as usual in these videos, I'm going to leave notes for you to freeze the screen should you want to but I'm just going to teach you from specific bits that are in bold and that I've highlighted. So Priestley deliberately tells the director that it has to be set in spring of 1912. Now there's a symbolic reason for that. Spring is a time for renewal and he's asking his audience to think about their own form of renewal in rejecting capitalism and embracing socialism which as you know is connected to the 1945 general election and the play is first performed just a few weeks before that election. But he also picks on this year 1912 because it points to a tragedy and that tragedy as you will know again is the sinking of the Titanic which happened in April and uh, the Titanic is just about to sink um, in 10 days time uh, or two weeks time just after Eva commits suicide. So he's planting the idea of a tragedy right at the very beginning. But the third reason he's picking on 1912 is that this is the time of the suffragette movement and the suffragettes fought for women to have the right to vote. It was called emancipation, the right to vote. And this is a feminist play. So that all comes from that quotation. Now, the next thing that Priestley is keen on is telling the directors, look, you can have a totally realistic setting where you recreate the dining room of the Burlings house. However, I'm going to strongly encourage you, he says, to pick a symbolic setting. Now, this is important because it tells us that this is a symbolic play. In other words, all the people in it represent other ideas and other things and all the events represent other ideas and other things. And you'll be familiar with my idea that the First World War um, recurs as the Second World War, and that's symbolised by the death of the first Eva Smith and then that last phone call when she appears to die again because the Burlings didn't learn their lesson. Well, let's have a look at the quotations that are interesting in the symbolic setting of the opening stage directions. He says that the furniture has to be heavily comfortable. Now this is nearly an oxymoron. An oxymoron is two contradictory ideas jammed together. Uh, so you would think that furniture that was really heavy might not be comfortable to sit in, but he's making it comfortable. And then there's another oxymoron here. It's home-like, so it looks like a home, but it is not cosy. And so the symbolism here is we are at home with a family, but they are not cosy with each other. They're not comfortable with each other. The atmosphere is heavy. It doesn't feel right. And that's all done through the symbolism of the setting. And the clue that he wants us to think more of the symbolism than the realistic setting is this, where he advises the director, who would be well advised to dispense with an ordinary realistic set. Um, and then he gives reasons why. Okay, the next point that Priestley wants to bring to our attention is Edna. Edna is just clearing the table. So visually on stage, she represents the working woman. She is hard at work and she'll be completely ignored by the other characters for most of it. And her presence on the stage is a reminder of the lack of interest in these upper class men and women in the lives of ordinary people. So she is there on stage so that we can visibly see her being ignored and being subservient to the family that she's serving, who will react without gratitude. They will simply have an air of expectation. OK, there is now a rather odd detail. He says that the dining room table should have no cloth on it. Now, this is a question of etiquette. Etiquette are the rules of social interaction. And in Edwardian times, there would have been a really strict etiquette. So you're having guests round, the table must be covered, not just in any cloth, 
but a heavy white one. It's the kind of cloth you still get in good restaurants today. So why doesn't this family have that cloth? Well, one, white is associated with innocence, and it could be that Priestley does not want us to associate any of the Burlings with innocence. Instead, the inspector is going to come and prove their guilt. Another possibility is that these characters see themselves as superiors to others, but they are not following the rules of etiquette. So this is a way of exposing them as actually not superior. And then a final interpretation might be Priestley saying, well, actually, they shouldn't be superior. None of us are superior. We're all equal. Let's just get rid of the cloth and visually represent our equality like that. He could be saying that this idea of superior class is just a veneer, a cover, just like the cloth is a cover and a veneer. So pick out which of those interpretations you like best and apply it in your essay. Well, here is another really interesting idea about Edwardian etiquette, and it's the rules governing what drinks you have when. So the champagne has to arrive before the port, but even more importantly than that, you must have both at the meal. You've got to have champagne and then you've got port. And the port arrives in a decanter. That's a pretty big um, container. And the port glass is already on the table. So there's no question of you not drinking it. So one of the things that uh, Priestley could be suggesting here is that the upper classes are actually permanently drunk. They drink too much. No wonder they make such bad decisions about ordinary people. They're not, if you like, rational and in their right minds because they're so often drinking. And obviously, he dramatizes this through Eric's alcoholism. And I mean, Eric's only about 22 and he's already an alcoholic. That's quite unusual. But Priestley is suggesting, suggesting not in an upper class household where they're forced to drink loads of alcohol every single meal. It's just the way it goes. So this is obviously a criticism of the upper classes. A really interesting idea is how Priestley dresses uh, the men. So all five are in evening dress of the period. The men in tails and white ties, not dinner jackets. So what this means is He's restricting the movements of the actors on stage. I'll show you a picture in a minute so you can see what this looks like. But they really are wearing deeply uncomfortable clothes to eat in and relax. Uh, well, what happens then is that everybody looks uncomfortable on stage. And dramatically, that's really important because Priestley's trying to show that the upper classes are not at home in their own skin as real people. They're not normal like the rest of us. And visually, we'll be able to see that they aren't normal. But worse, their difference, which they see as superior, we will see as inferior because they look so uncomfortable. So here is a typical image that I'm borrowing from blacktieguide.com of what it would look like. You can see how upright and stiff all these men look. This is what tails mean. The jacket comes down right below, uh, down to your knee. Very uncomfortable to sit in. And you can see the sorts of high starched collars that they would have worn that would have been very uncomfortable to eat in. And then obviously the bow tie and uh, a tight buttoning. All this would have been starched at the front uh, so that it felt almost like a breastplate. So deeply uncomfortable and a visual way to show the audience that these people are not at ease. Now, this is in direct contrast to the kind of clothing that Eric, for example, would have worn um, socially. So this is taken from 1910, 11, 12, exactly at the right same time. And you can see how relaxed and casual the normal suit could feel in comparison to the dinner jacket. Well, it's probably very likely that you've been taught already about the significance of the lighting in this scene. Uh, so the lighting should be pink and intimate. Now, one reason to make it pink is that it seems softer, as though the family are together. But we also associate pink with the idea of 
rose-tinted spectacles. Pink becomes a symbol then of self-delusion. So they are comfortable only because they've got this deluded version of what reality is. And Priestley wants to change that reality and take away that self-delusion and show them the truth. And that's why, as soon as the inspector arrives, the pink lighting disappears and it now becomes brighter and harder. Now, symbolically, this symbolizes the truth, which is brighter, we can see it, but it's also harder because there's no self-deception. The inspector has arrived to show the family what they're really like, both to each other, so they realize uh, how their own other members of the family have exploited Eva, but also to themselves. He's taken away that personal self-deception so that Sheila, for example, can no longer claim that she was justified in getting Eva sacked because Eva would be all right anyway because she was pretty. You know, that's now exposed as a false justification. And similarly, Berlin can no longer claim that he was right to have her sacked because she was only asking for extra pay, which is fair, even according to Eric, never mind the inspector. You probably haven't considered this stage direction, which separates the Berlin parents. So the four Burlings and Gerald are seated at the table, with Arthur Burling at one end, his wife at the other. Now this is actually a breach of etiquette. Uh, you know, um, in terms of the Edwardian etiquette, only the male would be at the end, so Arthur Burling would be at the end, and the others would be um, together in the middle. And this would be quite visually clear because you'd have four people sitting in the middle and one at the end. However, staging it this way leaves Eric out on his own. You've got uh, Sheila and Gerald who are together and Eric as the odd one out. Now visually that's really important because it shows that Eric is going to be the odd one out, the most important one, if you like, in the play. And when we think about Eva's life, he is the one who finally gets her pregnant and arguably uh, leads to her suicide um, through his probable rape of her. Uh, I've dealt with that in other videos. The other thing it does is it asks us to decide who is in control. Is it Arthur Burling at one end of the table or is it his wife Sybil Burling at the other? Um, we're suddenly not sure. Now an audience in 1945 would have picked this up straight away. A modern audience will struggle because we don't know about the etiquette, but now that you do, you can see how visually Priestley is questioning the power relationships. Now, what's he playing at here? Well, in many ways, this is a feminist play. So a patriarchal society is a society controlled by men, uh, where power lies with men and they exercise that power in their own interests and women have far fewer rights. Well, suddenly this seating arrangement is challenging that. Suddenly, Sybil Burling seems to have as much power as her husband. And you'll see in the first scene, she orders him about. Um, she does take control a lot of the time. And this is linked directly to what's going on in 1912, which is the rise of the suffragette movement. Suffrage was the term used to describe having the vote. Uh, women wanted the vote, they wanted suffrage, and so they were called the suffragettes, the female campaigners for getting the vote. Now in 1945, women did have the vote, but they didn't take it for granted. It was something that many women had fought for and even died for. So this is a really powerful message in the play, where Priestley is suggesting that the turning point of 1912 is when women started to have their own identity in society and started to achieve their own rights, which in 1945 were not complete. You know, women were still very subservient to men in many ways, but they had just experienced the Second World War from 1939 to 1945, and while millions of men went abroad to fight, women, of course, had to step in and do the jobs that were previously done by men, and they didn't do them badly, did they? They were equally capable as the men, and this newfound independence also led to newfound feelings of self-worth and a demand 
for the patriarchal society to start shifting in women's favour. And Priestley, it seems, in this play, is in favour of that. He wants women to have a much greater say, and not least because in the 1945 election they are now going to have a deciding vote in deciding who forms the government. And Priestley obviously wants them to choose a socialist one. And then finally, why Eric is the odd one out, I've pretty much dealt with, I guess, but there is another quotation which tells us this isn't an accident and Priestley wants us to pay attention to it. It's this, Eric downstage and Sheila and Gerald seated upstage. So if this is our stage and down here where my arrow is, my is the audience, backstage is up here, out of view, and upstage is here, in the audience's view. So Priestley is really particular that you can't just seat your characters anyway. Eric has to be here, right where the audience can see him all the time. This means they'll spot his drunkenness, it means that they'll spot his nervousness, and it means that they will know something is deeply wrong with Eric. And that prepares us for the magical change in Act 2 when Mrs. Burling condemns the father of Eva's child, led on by the inspector, and then curtain up for Act 3, Eric arrives and says, you know, don't you? Um, he is exposed. And that moment is prepared for in the opening stage directions. That's the genius of the structure of this play. And writing about that will get you into the very top grades. So in your comments below, please let me know whether this style of page helps you so that you can focus on the bits that I'm teaching, but also go back, should you wish to, to make notes from the other stuff on the page, or whether, in fact, you'd prefer me to get rid of all the other writing and just have the bits that we're focusing on. What would help you learn better? Well, thank you very much. Don't forget to subscribe to get more videos that will get you the top grades. See you soon on my channel.